Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on promoting gender equality in science. My name is Silvia Muccelli, and I will be moderating uh, today's session. So this webinar is uh, organized uh, within the Hybrid Neuro Project that is founded by the European Union, Union and uh, UK Research and Innovation. And uh, um, this project uh, uh, focuses on uh, hybrid neuroscience based on uh, brain and muscle functions and muscle signals for motor rehabilitation and neuromuscular disorder. Uh, the project includes a number of activities, um, among which uh, an exploratory project on uh, the topic I just mentioned, but also a lot of training activities to improve soft, soft skills of our uh, uh, students and collaborators. And among those, we have summer school workshops and webinars. And uh, this is one of the weighted webinars that we have uh, within, uh, that we organize uh, within the project. This webinar is about uh, um, uh, the importance of uh, gender equality in science. And I'm very pleased to have a speaker, uh, Maria Salin, who is the coordinator of the uh, project Gini. GINI stands for uh, Gender Initiative for Excellence and is a project financed by Chalmers University of Technology that aims to create an inclusive environment uh, supportive of uh, female faculty and supportive of excellence in research and teaching. Uh, today's seminar will be recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to see the seminar even afterwards, but uh, we have uh, two different views on team, one for the presenters and one for the attendance. So um, uh, your voice will not be recorded. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and uh, I will ask Maria to address uh, these questions. Maria is very keen to uh, interact with you. So don't wait until the end of the seminar. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have the possibility to ask a question at the end, but uh, also during the seminar, if there is anything you want uh, to ask about, uh, don't be shy. Maria will be able uh, to reply. So I hope you all enjoy the seminar and uh, I will now uh, leave the floor to Maria. Uh, thanks all of you for joining you. Joining you. Super. Thank you, Silvia, and thanks for having me. This is very nice. Um, strange to talk to a screen, but I know you're out there. So please, yeah, as Silvia said, write something in the chat if you have questions, if you don't understand or it doesn't make sense what I'm saying or you, something comes up in your mind. Some good idea. Um, promoting gender equality in science. So Silvia said I work in a project called Genie uh, at Chalmers and uh, I will be presenting that more uh, in the fall here at Chalmers. So today I'll talk more about the broader sense of gender equality in science. Uh, why is it important? Why care? Uh, so I'm, I'm a biochemist and a biophysicist um, and I've done a lot of research in drug discovery. Uh, so I know what sort of science is about, but I think it's really important with the human beings behind. And that's why I, that's why I started working with gender equality. And I think gender equality is it's almost a human problem. Uh, or a human task. We need it in all parts of, of society. Uh, and I think being in academia, I like being here because we work to solve the challenges of society. And we need all the brains and all the people to do their best to, to make it work. We have a lot of challenges in society and in, on our planet and beyond. And if we sort of limit the people who's going to solve those problems to a few people, we're probably not going to solve it as much as we could. So I, I just want to make sure that everyone can can help out and do their best. That's why I work with gender equality. I will give you some data on how status is today, why we need to improve, uh, and some, some tips in the end what you can do, where you can find more resources, uh, both for teaching, research, and, and generally. Uh, and I think I'll start with some historic and geographic data, and then we'll come to this sort of the more actions. Uh, so if we look in the world, it's, it's a big world out there. Uh, and historically, this is data from UNESCO. Uh, from The first data points are from 1970, 72, uh, and up to uh, 2017. So for some of the parts of the world, we have 
a lot of data for some it's less but i think it's just interesting to see that we have a slight increase in all parts of the world uh, but also quite different uh, backgrounds historically and culturally we have very different places and this affects of course how uh, we work in academia and how people are welcome uh, for example at chalmers the first woman to study was 1914 the chalmers is a university that's 200 years old soon and the first female professor came 1984 so we are yeah men have been in for much longer than women so it's good to keep that in mind but this is basically human traits how we have been i see it as we are marinated and we are almost like robots that have been not robots but we've been programmed in the world and society where we live and that makes us products of that and there are some biases in in the society and that affects how we behave and also what processes and and what structures we make and i think being aware of that will make it easier for us to kind of change it back and make it balanced back so that's my view on this so here you see some historic data and some on the on the sort of the whole world if we zoom in on sweden uh, where where i work uh, this is a list in Swedish of all the Swedish universities. There's a mix of STEM universities and uh, social sciences. But what's the point is that in the bottom, yeah, uh, in the bottom is Chalmers Technical University. We have 20, this is data from 2021, and we have 18% female professors. Uh, it's not what we want to have, and that's why the Gini initiative started amongst other things. But it's it's important to see that there's a difference. Uh, and even if Sweden looks like we have a lot of female uh, rights in society and a lot of female at the university from the previous slide, when it comes to the top positions, we don't have that many. And if we zoom in even more to Chalmers, our university, these are the different, the PhD students, the different positions in academia, postdocs, assistant professors, associate professors, professor and full professor. This is along the time that the Gene Initiative has gone on. In some of the groups, you see slight increases, but overall, uh, overall, we have this leaky pipeline, as we talk about, that the women maybe start a little bit close to 50%. At some departments, it's 50%, and then it goes down. Why is this? Well, why should we care about gender equality? Some people might say that gender equality has gone too far. I mean, this has been a problem as long as uh, in academia, as long as academia has let women to come in. Um, but I think in society, it's it's been a, an issue for a long, long time, power position. Some people say it's not my problem, it's a woman's problem. Uh, I think this is an issue for everyone. And I hope the data I'll show you is gonna convince you all that that's the case. Uh, some people think, it's not me, I've taken the training, I know what to do. Uh, unfortunately, I think you'll never be trained enough and it's important to teach each other along the way. So it's more, I'm more after a culture of helping each other to improve and be better. But why care? The problem is, of course, that there are few women in academia and the higher the rank, as I showed you, the less the women. And we have historic and cultural norms that rule society. I think if you consider yourself, your own life, you know that there, there are times when you feel like this is not appropriate to do if you're a woman, a man, or whatever you consider yourself. There are a lot of rules, unwritten and written rules. Um, and this often leads to unconscious bias and unfairness towards women. I'll talk, show more of some unconscious bias data soon. In the academic system, we want to say that we are fair, that we have a merit meritocratic system that is fair and based on what people produce. Uh, and to a certain extent, it's true and it's fair, but there are systematic biases against women um, in fundings, publications and positions. And I'll show a little bit of that data. And this, of course, affects the work environment and women's confidence. And, and in the long run, this is bad for all. Science showed that if you have a mixed group where people feel belonging, you do produce better data, better inventions. People feel better and can be their best. So if it's fixed, as I said, diverse groups, they do better. And there's a lot of science saying that you have more high impact papers and more creative. The different groups take different approaches. And this is what I am after. This is what's driving me. If you have a different group, you look at the question a bit, slightly different, and hopefully can come up with a solution that is new and what we need. 
But to get there, we need female role models that encourage more young female to enter science and to stay in science and feel like you belong. Because you need to have 30 percent, um, around 30 percent to feel or more to feel like you're not a minority, to feel like you belong and that you have a voice and you dare to speak up. And you can, of course, I talk about gender equality, but you can look about, talk about many different minority groups. If you're less than 30 percent, it's hard to feel like you have a voice. You need to be very strong to speak up. So that's good to keep in mind. Think about when you belong to a minority group or to majority. And if you're the majority, maybe you help someone from the minority to speak up. Because they probably have a different view than you. And also industry wants female scientists and engineers and men trained in gender equality. So this is as a university, we need this to, we need to help out. This is one of our tasks. And focusing on diversity and gender will improve the university's trademark and output. So I think it's a, for me, it's a given. This is something we need to work on as a university. And there is much more in, the, I put some references down here, feel free to, to use them. And on the Gini website, we have a resource list. And many of the papers I refer to today, you can find on that list. So bias against women in evaluation. So we all have unconscious bias. And I think, yeah, you do. Everyone does. It's not fun when you be caught having it, but that's, we're just human beings who are kind of marinated in this society where we grew up. Uh, and for me, it started with one, uh, public, one publication that came out in 1997. Uh, it was the starting point for me and I think many women in Sweden. Uh, it was published in Nature and it was showing that females need to have met much more merits to get the same competence score. Uh, so if you see my red arrow here, this is a paper when they looked at many, many applications and compared the competence score, meaning what the experts that were evaluating the group, what score they gave the applicant. And you compare that with the total impact. And here impact is one journal with impact one gives one point. So for example, Nature, which is roughly 25 in impact, gives you a 25. So you, this is how they measured. And comparing these, women need to do much, much more than men to get the same competence score, which is what the evaluators were looking at. Roughly, well, here is, you see the difference is about from 19 to 60, 70. So a woman needs to say 64, 65, you need to publish three nature papers to be equally seen as a male peer, or you need to publish 20 uh, publications in, in, a, in a journal with impact factor three. It's quite a lot. So, yeah, keep that in mind. And it's both men and women that have biases. If you think about this group of experts who are doing this evaluation, they don't want to be mean, they don't want to be unfair, but they are, and it's both men and women. And here's another uh, article uh, from 2012, and there's been many studies showing about the same. Uh, here, a CV was sent out, uh, either with a female name or a male name. And it was sent out to a broad group of people, old, young experts, um, men, women. And they were asked whether this person, what sort of, what salary would you give this person? And the male, th those who got the CV with a male name, were going to say, yes, this person will get a much higher salary than if it was a female name, but it's the same CV. And the same goes for if you, what's the competence, the higher ability and the mentoring for this woman or the man. So just showing that we all carry this, even if we don't want to. And, and there is a test called Harvard Implicit Bias Test. You can, if you haven't tried it, you should try it. It makes me really mad when I do it. <laughs> because I, of course, I fall for most of what they want to show you. But that's, that's the purpose, to know yourself that, okay, I also have some, some biases. So I think just knowing about that, we can together uh, counter, counteract in the way we behave. But this is at the evaluation level. When you look at the CVs, prior to getting your CV, I want to show you uh, a data that came out 2022 um, that talks about that women are less 
uh, credited than men in science. There's a lot of science, there's publications saying that women uh, have a greater responsibility for being home, taking care of kids or parents, and they might have a different type of super supervision. Um, maybe they uh, work in a less welcoming environment. Many things happen, but this is one where you look at uh, what is the credit you get? It's not a simple task, but what they did is they, over four years, followed almost 10,000 teams that had 129,000 individuals, uh, which published a bunch of articles and did patents. And they were kind of comparing what authorship did you get compared to your actually how much time you put into the work. So they were at the place doing the work and they did this through looking at the data, but also have interviews and surveys. So several points and divided by sort of your role, if you would have gotten a fair uh, share of the authorship, you would expect that the points would sort of fall on the on the line in the middle. Uh, but what you see here is that women's share of potential author authorship is less than the actual authorship. So all groups, faculty, postdocs, graduate, undergraduates and even research staff I mean, the research staff is even further away from being fairly treated. And all, all sort of subjects of science show the same pattern. Engineering that you belong to is also quite far down. So there's something we do uh, in not really giving value the work that women do. And I think you all have heard about Rosalind Franklin, who was uh, working with the DNA structure with Watson and Crick. Uh, she's one of them. Without her, it wouldn't have worked out, but she was not rewarded. She did not get the Nobel Prize. I think it goes in the same line. So why care? So you see, it's harder to get the sort of build your CV. It's harder when you get evaluated, but why does it care? And then, of course, there's a lot of science saying that more diversity gives better science. And I think it gives a better work environment and it's more fun and it's just humanly fair. Um, but if you look into some papers, here is one from Nature, uh, where they looked into uh, two and a half million papers um, when they looked at the ethnicity of the authors and saw that if four out of five, four or five of the authors came from different parts of the world, and this is based on, on sort of your name, uh, they had more citations. So mixed groups in that sense gave higher, uh, higher impact. Another reference, which I think is really nice, uh, shows that if you have a better work-life balance, not that you work more, but you have a good work-life balance and a sort of an attitude to, to life and while you do the research, you publish in higher quality papers. Good to strive for. And the last paper, which I really like, uh, came out in 2022. It shows that gender uh, is one of the sort of hidden secrets to increase the success. And here they've looked into both, they call it the novelty. Um, so this is they measured it by seeing uh, references. Do you have the same set of references as other journals or, or is it a unique set of kind of basis that you use your research on? And also the upper tail papers, the top 5%. And what they see here is that the mixed groups, the red line is of course higher than the same sex gender could be just male and just or just female. So both more novel and more upper tail. So mixed groups, they, they do a bit better. Okay. If we talk about the academic environment where we all work, it has certain sort of criteria. We have the physical environment. Uh, and this is data taken from Lisa Huso, who is a professor of gender studies from Örebro University. You have the physical environment that makes up our work environment. We have the school classrooms, we have the buildings, we have the coffee places, the food, the sort of the physical places where we are. But we also have the social environment, uh, which is the key for many things. And this is, of course, a whole field of studies, and I made it very simple. But I think social environment is the culture, the way, what's in between human beings. And Lisa Husser would put the words, this is such as values, norms, ideals, histories, heroes, forms of collegiality, behavioral patterns and codes, 
ways of speaking, symbols, rituals, ceremonies, dress codes, humor, taboos, many small things. This makes up the social environment in which we work. This is different at different places. If we think about the academic culture, which is what I talked about recently, and gender, there are a couple of concepts that make it, uh, I would say, limitation. And if you think of these, uh, you probably can find a story of your own or something where this makes, it makes sense for you. But the academic culture is hierarchical, sometimes informal, competition and collaboration. We have this implicit or unconscious bias in evaluation, as I showed you, uh, and assessment, which was this Jane James with the CV, two different uh, people. This is part of the academic culture and the gender aspect. There is a stereotype of research academic engineer that it's male. Uh, if you talk to generalizing, of course, but if you talk to people on the street or go to schools and ask them to draw a researcher, academic person or an engineer, most often you will get uh, a white male, maybe in a lab coat. So we have a stereotype and this spills over. So you would call that uh, academia is a gendered organization and it's male dominated. Women are more sort of the opposite to men. Um, men are rarely pro problematized as men. Uh, as I said, we, we, they are the norm and what's not men, that's what you talk about. You often talk about something called homosociability. Uh, men prefer men and validate men. And the same goes for women that you, where you can see yourself, it's much easier. You have something that is similar, it's easy. But once you have a norm, that norm tends to stay. This is a human trait. So knowing of this makes it easier to break it. And we are all part of it. So men are often the stereotype. And then women, we say the visibility paradox of women, they're seen as women, uh, but maybe less seen as colleagues. There is there's a tendency that you, the sex, as Lisa Husso puts it, she says the sex role spills over, becomes an academic motherhood, that the women are seen as the ones who should take care of PhD students who need help, or the visitor that come, or the maybe even making the coffee if you draw it to the extreme. There's some subconscious uh, view that maybe the women are uh, more mothers. Uh, and then we have this informal division of labor. And compared to what I just said right now, um, there's a risk of something called academic household work, that this tends to be the women who take care of everything that is not meritocratically. You don't get credits in your CV. Uh, there are some some men that do it, for, of course. This, I'm, I'm very generalizing what I say now. Um, but that this, the, the gender roles make women more feel like I have to do this than men. And then unfortunately, sexual harassment of students and staff, it, it occurs and uh, more often women are the victims. So taking this um, about gender discrimination, which is not so fun, but we need to know that it exists. Uh, there's a nice quote from Paula Kaplan, who's been writing a book called Lifting a Ton of Feathers. So imagine lifting a ton of feathers, where she says, typically when one forms one form of prejudice, such as sexism or racism, is labeled as unacceptable, something we should not do, it does not simply vanish. Rather, it tends to take increasingly subtler forms thus protecting the prejudiced person from both social and legal accusations. So it kind of becomes invisible, but it's still there. This has been, um, and, and this has become, this is more of a process than single incidents. It's more something that happens over and over again. So imagine her, her image lifting a ton of feathers. So each time something happens that is not, not perfectly nice, it's a feather. But after a while, that becomes heavier. And this concept had also been uh, talked about by Virginia Valen and Lisa Husso. Lisa Husso calls it non-events. Uh, Virginia Valen calls it molehills become mountains. 
So small, small, small things adds up. And these are own witnessed cognitive experiences. So we can't, it's for the person who is, who is there. And one can also explain it a little bit more uh, as ac accumulation of disadvantages, small repeated in micro events, microaggressions that often are combined with a power position. And what these could be, um, could be finalists, exclusions, bypassing, ignoring, making invisible, lack of support, lack of validation, not being seen, heard, encouraged, taken into account, validated, supported, asked along. And these, we have done some research in, in Gini exper um, project as well. And this you can find at Chalmers. I think it exists everywhere. It's not outspoken. It's not every day, every day. It's not everywhere, but it's just small things that slowly adds up. And this ha happens more to women than to men. And you can imagine how that repeatedly, just a little bit of not being treated the same as your peers, eventually it shows in your CV. Okay, that's quite negative. Uh, and of course, this says gender equality has has something that's been going on for a long, long time, and people have been trying to sort it. So I wanted to share one slide. There's a lot of data. Uh, it's from uh, from Harvard, from a researcher there called um, Frank Dobbin. He and his colleague Andrea uh, Andrea Caleb they've been looked into many, many gender equality initiatives, and these initiatives are also just not gender equality but broader diversity. But what I would like to point out is that there are, this is where they've looked into change over time after five years uh, of different initiatives. So for example, mandatory diversity training, testing of the applicant, grievance systems, which are important that you can uh, let people know what's happening, but they need to be done in a correct way. Voluntary training, self-managed teams, cross-training, um, recruitment uh, of particularly women, uh, of other minorities, uh, mentoring, diversity task force, and diversity managers. And here they divided into the three top ones um, are students do one more uh, are things that many universities do, but they have a negative effect. And I think it's good to know what has been. On a, on a big scale worked and what has not worked. So testing um, is usually not a good thing because uh, it tends to be that you, the ones that are the norm, um, they kind of slip through. You don't really ask them the questions, whereas the ones that are outside the box, those you, you ask really hard and then they fail and they feel like they're maybe not part of the group. Uh, complaint systems lead to retaliation. So if you set up a complaint system, uh, be really careful how this is done. You need to complain to someone. You need to have a process that take care of what's going on, uh, but it has to be set up in a professional, good way. But what works is voluntary training. So it all has to be come from within. And I think that is, a, uh, that is something that I bring with me in, in the Genie project. It has to be people want to do this, otherwise it's not going to stay. So voluntary based activities work. Uh, mixing people. There's something good in, in people. And once you meet and you see stories and you meet someone who is, uh, has an story to tell you or an experience, that sticks. It has been positive to recruit, uh, to recruitment to targeting women. So really pinpoint women and make them come. Then of course you need to think about how to make them stay. And to promote social accountability. To have groups with diversity task force. There's a lot of data in this slide and um, feel free to look at it, but it's good to know that there's, there's a lot of science behind this. So what should one focus on? Uh, and here's a long list of more things that ha have worked. Uh, and this is based on the advanced program in the States. Um, and there's a book that came out 2020 that goes through uh, everything they've done. But you can divide it in four steps. So we have the formal processes, which is inclusive recruitment, as we saw recently, it works in hiring. And you need to be really aware of how you do these uh, evaluations. Uh, equitable processes for promotion and tenure, same here. Be aware of how you ask the question, who's asking the question, are you treating people equally? Uh, and strengthen the accountability structures, but do it in a good way. 
Well, one thing is we often say, talking about the formal processes, that the leaders at the university and uh, the managers, they're appointed because they're really good in academic setting, but maybe not so well trained in being a researcher or being a leader. So here we can we can improve. At the workplace, um, yeah, the development of the institutional leaders uh, is key. Improving the department's climate, here we can all help out. Uh, the climate is what we all make together. We can think about when you have seminars, when you have people visiting, um, who's talking, who's being seen, who's being valued, when you go to conferences. Uh, yeah, what is out facing? And even if you don't feel like you have power over other people, you probably do. Um, enhance visibility for women and gender issues. Put it on the table. It's really important to make sure that gender equality is part of the agenda and high priority. It's not easy, but you can start by asking questions and making sure that people talk about it. You need to see the whole person. Uh, one can do support for dual career couples. Uh, it happened several times at Chalmers that you want to hire someone, but then the partner did not find a job. So considering the whole package, the whole family, whatever the family is. Flexible work, work arrangements and family friendly accommodations. Probably good for both men and women uh, and fostering the university we want. And as I showed before that there's research, if you have a good work life balance, you produce better research or higher impact. Individual support and um, professional development. Uh, for the faculty. Make sure that those who want to develop in. In, in inclusive speaking, inclusive um, leadership can do this. You can have special grants for individuals targeted uh, for the recruitments. And then, of course, mentoring and networks activities. Uh, what one should think about is to not assume too much. It's easy to assume that the engineers and natural scientists are incapable of understanding or striving towards gender equality or increasing in increased diversity. So don't assume this. I think we should think higher of ourselves. I want to give you some examples what you can do when you're teaching. Uh, so before I've talked about sort of the general working together in groups, uh, how we act as human beings, uh, the lot of behavior. I want to give you some examples now on when you're teaching. Uh, it can be hard to think about if gender has an aspect. And there's, of course, another field of research and a lot of resources. Um, and one place in, uh, in Bremen, they have a lot of computer science education. And they realize that men and women are not equally represented. Uh, and of course, they want that to happen. Um, so to do that, the students uh, learn about gender mainstreaming and culture. And it goes down to the social, socialization of children and young people inside and outside of school. So then to talk about this, you have to teach your uh, your students, what is socialization and do some experiments connected to the computer science uh, to make sure that this, this aspect is part of all parts of the education. Um, gender division in labor characterizes the industrial society. What does this mean? Uh, thinking about the society you're going to end up in once you have completed your degree. How has gender an aspect there? And software as it is, it maybe it's neutral, you would think, but it's also created by a human being. And it's usually young white male users, and those are also the teams that have created it. So being conscious of this is, is a good thing if you want to kind of counterbalance that. So then of course, this requires software design methods that combine a conscious reflection on societal contexts with the technological, te technological development. So this is not easy, um, but Bremen has thought about it. 
and they want to make a future scientists more sensitive to the role that gender plays in all research and in their education. So for example, here is what they have done. Before, you don't have to read everything, uh, but in their, their curriculum, they've added in the end that this course uh, should also consider the needs, patterns and use of expectations of diverse people. And while promoting respect for diversity, equity and gender equality. Sounds good. How is this done? They have a good, I'd, I'd share you the link here. They have step by step how they do this. So just adding to every subject, one can add a gender aspect. And that both gives the students broader perspective and probably helps you to tap into new research areas. I found another good uh, resource, uh, a toolkit that I passed along here that you can have a look at if you if you're teaching and you want to just have ideas, is there something in my field where I could add a gender, a gender equality? In research, you might have seen about this um, aspect. There's, of course, gender equality in research as well. This is a classic example of the crash test dummies. It used to be a male body, about 175, kind of like me, uh, 78 kilos. So they made the, the doll look that look that, that way. And of course, um, male have less injuries than female. So this was something that was worked on. And actually this is a Swedish woman, Astrid Linder, uh, who in 2022 sort of launched this female body uh, to make sure that you test both male and female bodies in, in the cars. Makes a lot of sense, but you need to develop uh, technology is is not better than uh, sort of how much the inventors were thinking. And you can you just play with your mind in biomedical research. It's often been that the male body is the norm. It's easier uh, it's less hormones going around. And you also had all the military guys in a certain age. You standardized it. Makes sense as a starting point, but now it's time to broaden up. In architecture, it can be easier to find examples where gender has an aspect. For example, for whom is the city created? Where do we put a bridge in the city? Is it close to the daycare, the grocery store, the highway, the industry, the golf club? How do we, how do we want people to move around and who is the city for? So in architecture, there's a lot of research with gender aspects. And I find it's interesting with AI and ChatGTP and all this kind of using big databases. That's just a reflection of what's in the past. We really need to mirror this. So in machine learning, <clears throat> there's been a big project called the Shades Project, where they create an intersectional training data set where darker skinned women, uh, darker skinned men and lighter skinned women and lighter skinned men have been created. So you can do the work you need to do on sort of broader set of human beings. Uh, I shared you the link here to from Stanford University. They have lots of good examples just to sort of poke your mind and get a little bit thinking. Uh, and regarding going back to gender equality in academia and the behavior and how we can make a better work environment for everyone. There's many ongoing projects and efforts. I talked, I showed some data from the Advance project from the USA. There's a big uh, effort in UK called Athena Swan. That's a charter and you sort of have to buy into it and pay a membership fee, but they have a lot of knowledge and, uh, and help you can get. And also in Ireland, for example, they connected the funding to if you get the Athena Swan uh, certification or not. Uh, SAGE or UNICEF are two big uh, EU projects that are looking into tools, how to make gender equality in academia. What can you do? What is data? Yeah, what data is there? Uh, and Hans University has a big subgroup called diversity and inclusion, uh, thinking about what we can do in everything that has to do with uh, universities, both for mobility of students, mobility of staff. Uh, how do we do micro credentials when we have meetings? How can diversity be part of this to make sure that we get the best out of everyone? Uh, Leru, uh, here are two links. Uh, Leru has also been an initiative on gender equality, Genport. Um, oh, there's a long list of things that's ongoing. So resources is out there. 
once you want to do, uh, yeah, make your workplace a bit better. I've said many things. Some things I uh, hope stick. Uh, to conclude, uh, what, basically this is it. Gender equality, um, it's a challenge, but it's also a prerequisite for excellence in research and education. We are all biased, um, whether we want it or not. And I think acknowledging that makes it easier to move beyond and, and help each other. And the academic system, there's many, many more research articles than I showed to you. Uh, and I have to say, maybe in evaluation that we are getting a bit better. The data I showed you was from 2012 and 1997. We have approved a little bit, uh, but not in giving uh, credit. That was from 2022. But the academic system is not neutral, so we need to work on that. And we should look at merits. Uh, do we look for qualitative or quantitative things? Academia is gendered. It's a gendered work environment. We have some norms uh, and they have an easy way to move. Uh, everything else is kind of against the norm and being conscious of that makes us able to change. Sexual harassment occurs and there's a lot of reports on this. We had a big study in Sweden two years ago uh, and it's it's unfortunately way too common than we want it to be. Makes women uh, leave academia or have a really bad experience and the people around her. Uh, small non-events or lifting a ton of feathers or molehills become mountains. They do occur uh, quite often uh, they are quite invisible, but they add up and make sh female, female researchers feel not included, not as much as their male peers. And this is something where everyone can be aware. We can try to help each other. Uh, in the beginning, I showed you some data from Chalmers uh, and I did not, maybe some of you picked up that in the group of assistant professors, we've had a bump up. There are many more female in this group, uh, around 50% since the Gini initiative started. I don't think we should take all the credit to the Gini initiative, but what's happened here is that we have broad calls and we recruit uh, these assistant professors in a group, which makes, uh, it has a, had a really, really positive effect. So the calls are really broad. It's for basic science, kind of a just a subtitle, and then anyone is welcome to apply. And we've had very good success. And this practice has also spread to other departments who now, by using that broader calls, having people come in a group, uh, we have many, many more women and a better balance. We need all colleagues to be aware and allies to speak up if we want to create a better work environment. So this is, this is a work for everyone. Um, leaders as much as all the way down to the undergrad students. We all make our culture um, and gender equal, equal groups are more successful. I hope I've made you see that. There's lots and lots of data and much, many, so many things to say and show, but I hope I've given you a little bit of bits and pieces and I'm very happy to take questions or thoughts or ideas and then I'll meet you maybe in, in the fall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mania, for your uh, excellent talk.